Good morning, Year 4. Um, I thought today for your reading session, I would read you um, one of the books that Stowe class voted on. Um, Fairford, I know that we were in the middle of uh, listening to the witches. I'm sure we'll get back to that at some point. But for now, Stowe class chose Bill's new frock, um, written by Anne Fine. So I thought I'd read you the first couple of chapters today, and then Mrs Cross, Mrs Clues might do some other chapters during the week. Um, I hope you enjoy. Okay, chapter one, a really awful start. When Bill Simpson woke up on Monday morning, he found he was a girl. He was standing, staring at himself in the mirror, quite baffled, when his mother swept in. Why don't you wear this pretty pink dress, she said. I never wear dresses, Bill burst out. I know, his mother said, it's such a pity. And to his astonishment, before he could even begin to argue, she had dropped the dress over his head and zipped up the back. I'll leave you to do up the shell buttons, she said. They're a bit fiddly and I'm late for work. As she swept out, leaving him staring in dismay at the mirror. In it, a girl with his curly red hair and wearing a pretty pink frock with fiddly shell buttons was staring back at him in equal dismay. This can't be true, Bill Simpson said to himself. This cannot be true. He stepped out of his bedroom just as his father was rushing past. He too was late um, in getting off to work. Mr. Simpson leaned over him and planted a kiss on Bill's cheek. Bye, Poppet, he said, ruffling Bill's curls. You look very sweet today. It's not often we see you in a frock, is it? And if I just show you that picture there, you can see Bill looking at himself in the mirror and very clearly as a girl. Bedroom's a bit of a mess as well. He ran down the stairs and out of the house so quickly he didn't see Bill scowl or hear what he muttered savagely under his breath. Bella, the cat, didn't seem to notice any difference. She purred and rubbed her soft furry body around his ankles in exactly the same way she always does. And Bill found himself spooning up his cornflakes as usual. It was as if he couldn't help it. He left the house at the usual time too. He didn't seem to have any choice. Things, though odd, were just going on in their own way, as if in a dream. Or could it be a nightmare? For hanging about on the corner was a gang of boys from the other school. Bill recognised the one they called Mean Malcolm in his purple studded jacket. I think I'll go around the long way instead, Bill thought to himself. I don't want to be tripped up in one of their nasty scuffles, like last week when all the scabs were kicked off my ankle. Then Bill heard the most piercing whistle. <whistles> he looked round to see where the noise was coming from, then realised mean Malcolm was whistling at him. Bill Simpson blushed so pink that all his freckles disappeared. He felt so foolish he forgot to turn off at the next corner to go round the long way. He ended up walking right past the gang. Mean Malcolm just sprawled against the railings, whistling at Bill as he went by wearing his pretty pink frock with shell buttons. Bill Simpson thought to himself, I'd rather have the scabs kicked off my ankles any day. When he reached the main road, there was an elderly woman with curly grey hair already standing at the curb. To feel safe from the gang, he stood at her side. Give me your hand, little girl, she said. I'll see us both safely across the road. No, really, insisted Bill. I'm fine. Honestly, I cross here every day by myself. But the woman simply didn't listen. She just reached down and grabbed his wrist, hauling him after her across the road. On the far side, she looked down approvingly as she resisted. That's such a pretty frock, she said. You mind you keep it nice and clean. Rather than say something disagreeable, Bill quickly ran off. The headmaster was standing at the school gates, holding his watch in the palm of his hand, watching as the last few stragglers arrived. Get your skates on, Stephen Irwin, he yelled, and move, Tom Warren. Another boy charged round the corner and cut in front of Bill. Late, Andrew, the headmaster called out fiercely. Late, late, late. Then it was Bill's turn to go past. That's right, the headmaster called out encouragingly. Run along, dear. We don't want to miss assembly, do we? and he followed Bill up the path to school. Assembly
assembly always took place in the main hall. After the hymn, everyone was told to sit on the floor, as usual. Desperately, Bill tried to tuck his pretty pink dress in tightly around his bare legs. Mrs Collins leaned forward, forward on her canvas chair. Stop fidgeting with your frock, dear, she told him. You're getting nasty, grubby fingerprints all around the hem. Bill glowered all, uh, sorry, Bill glowered all through the rest of the assembly. At the end, everyone stood up as usual. Now I need four strong volunteers to carry a table across the nursery, announced the headmaster. Who wants to go? Practically everyone in the hall raised a hand. Everyone liked to trip over to the playground. In the nursery, they had music and water and bright sloshy paints and tricycles and enormous Lego. And if you kept your head down and didn't talk too much or too loudly, it might be a good few minutes before anyone realised you were really from one of the other classrooms and shooed you back. So the hall was a mass of waving hands. The headmaster gazed around him. Then he picked four boys. On the way out of the hall, Bill Simpson heard Astrid complaining to Mrs Collins. It isn't fair. He always picks the boys to carry things. Perhaps the table's quite heavy, soothed Mrs Collins. None of the tables in the school are heavy, said Astrid. And I know for a fact that I'm stronger than at least two of the boys he picked. It's true, Bill said. Whenever we have a tug of war, everyone wants to have Astrid on their team. Oh, well, said Mrs Collins. It doesn't matter. No need to make such a fuss over nothing. It's a silly old table. And when Astrid and Bill took up arguing again, she told, the, she, she told them the subject was closed rather sharply. Back in the classroom, everyone settled down at their tables. We'll do our writing first, shall we? Said Mrs Collins. And after that, we'll reward ourselves with a story. While Mrs Collins handed out the writing books and everyone scrabbled for pencils and rubbers, Bill looked round his table. He was the only one in a dress. Flora, sorry, Flora was wearing trousers and a blue blouse. Kirsty and Nick were both wearing jeans and a shirt. Philip was wearing slacks and a red jumper. And Talila wore bright red satin bloomers under her fancy silk top. Yes, there was no doubt about it. Talila looked snazzy enough to go dancing. But Bill was the only one in a frock. Oh, this was awful. What on earth had happened? Why didn't anyone seem to have noticed? What could he do? When would it end? Bill Simpson put his head in his hands and covered his eyes. On with your work down there on table five, warned Mrs Collins promptly. She meant him. He knew it. So Bill picked up his pen and opened his books. He couldn't help it. He didn't seem to have any choice. Things were still going on in their own way, as in a dream. He wrote more than he usually did. He wrote it more neatly than usual too. If you looked back through the last few, few pages of work, you'd see he'd done a really good job for him. But you wouldn't have thought so the way Mrs Collins went on when she saw it. Look at this, she scolded, stabbing her finger on the page. This isn't very neat, is it? Look at that dirty smudge and the edge of your books looks like it's been chewed. She turned to Philip to inspect his book next. It was far messier than Bill's. It was more smudgy and more chewed looking. The writing was untidy and irregular. Now this is the next picture we've had. Let me pop it there for you. So you can see that Mrs Collins there pointing at Bill's work, saying it's not very neat. But then she's comparing it to the boy next to him and doesn't seem to mind that his is more smudged or more messy. And some of the letters were so enormous, they looked like giants herding the smaller letters haphazardly across the page. Not bad, Philip, she said. Keep up the good work. Bill could scarcely believe his ears. He was outraged. As soon as she'd moved off, he reached out for Philip's book, laid it beside his own on the table and compared the two. It isn't fair, he complained bitterly. Your page is much worse than my page. She didn't say anything nice to me. Bill just shrugged and said, well, girls are neater. Bill felt so cross he had to sit on his hands and stop himself from thumping Philip. Up at her desk, Mrs Collins was leafing through the class reader. Tales of today and yesterday. Where are we? She asked them. Where did we finish last week? Did we get to the end of Polly the pilot? She turned the page. 
Ah, she said, here's a good old story you all know perfectly well, I'm sure. It's Rapunzel. And today, it's Table Five's turn to take the main parts. Looking up, she eyed all six of them, sitting there waiting. You'll be the farmer, she said to Nick. You'll be the farmer's wife, she said to Delilah. Witch, she said to Flora. Prince, she said to Philip. Narrator, she said to Kirsty. Oh no, oh no. Bill held his breath as Mrs. Collins looked right at him and said, and you'll be the lovely Rapunzel. Before Bill could protest, Talila had started reading aloud. She and the farmer began with a furious argument about whether or not it was safe to steal a lettuce from the garden of the wicked witch next door to feed their precious daughter Rapunzel. Once they'd got going, Bill didn't like to interrupt them. So he just sat and flipped over the pages, looking for his first speech. It was a long wait. The lovely Rapunzel didn't seem to do very much. She just got, uh, sorry, she just got stolen out of spite by the witch and hidden away at the top of a very high stone tower, which had no door. There she just sat quietly for about 15 years, being no trouble and growing her hair. She didn't try to escape. She didn't complain. She didn't even have any fights with the witch. So far, as Bill Simpson could make out, she wasn't really worth rescuing. He wasn't all, sorry, he wasn't at all sure why the prince bothered. He certainly wouldn't have made the effort himself. After three pages, there came a bit for Rapunzel. Oh, Bill read out aloud. Oh, no, it wasn't much of a part or much of a life come to that, if you thought about it. Bill raised his hand, he couldn't help it. Yes, said Mrs. Collins. Well, what's the problem? She hated interruptions when they were reading. I don't see why Rapunzel just has to sit and wait for the prince to come along to rescue her, explained Bill. Why couldn't she plan her own escape? Why couldn't she cut off her long, lovely hair herself and braid it into a rope and then knock the rope down to something and slide down? Why did she have to sit there and waste 15 years for a prince? Mrs. Collins narrowed her eyes at Bill. You're in a very funny mood today, she said. Picture of uh, obviously him not wanting to be a poor little princess. Rapunzel just sat in the tower wanting to do something about it. Hmm, maybe the teacher's becoming suspicious. Are you sure you're feeling quite yourself? Was he quite feeling quite himself in this frock? Bill stared around the room. Everyone's eyes were on him. They were all waiting to hear what he said. What could he say? Mercifully, before he was forced to answer, the bell rang for playtime. Okay, that was chapter one. Now for chapter two. Chapter two is called The Wumpy Chew. Okay. Outside in the playground, a few boys were already kicking a football about. Bill Simpson was just about to charge in and join them when he remembered what he was wearing. He'd look a bit daft if he took a tumble, he decided. Maybe just for once he'd try to think of something else to do during playtime. Each boy who ran out of the school joined the football game on one side or another. What did the girls do? He looked around. Some perched along the nursery wall chatting to one another. Others stood in the cloakroom porch sharing secrets and giggling. There were more than a, sorry, there were a few more huddled in each corner of the playground. Each time the football came their way, one of them would give it a hefty boot back to the game. There were two girls trying to mark out a hop stops frame, but every time the footballers ran over the lines they were drawing, the chalk was so badly scuffed that you couldn't see the squares anymore. But it was rather chilly just standing about. The dress might be pretty, but it was thin and Bill's legs were bare. He decided to join the girls in the porch. At least they were out of the wind. As he came up to them, Lila was saying, Martin bets no one dares kick a football straight through the cloakroom window. And all girls looked up at the cloakroom window. You can see them there chatting inside. I wonder if the boys are going to take the dare. Um, the girls all looked up at the cloakroom window. So did Bill. As usual, the caretaker had pushed up the lower half of the window as far as it would go. It made quite a large square hole. Anyone could kick a football through there, scoffed Kirsty. I could, said Astrid. Easy, agreed Layla. 
What do you think you could do? Sorry, what do you get if you do it? Bill asked them. A wumpy chew. A wumpy chew? Bill said, mystified. Yes, Layla told them, a wumpy chew. Bill glanced around at the group of girls. Nobody else looked in the least bit baffled. Presumably, they all knew about wumpy chews, whatever they were. I don't know, you could get wumpy chews around here, said Flora. So, they were rare, were they? Like giant pandas? Oh, I'd love a wumpy chew, said Sarah, but I'm not allowed because I'm allergic. Definitely an animal then, I thought, a furry one. Bill's next door neighbour was allergic to furry animals too. What colour is it? asked Astrid. Is it a pink one? If it was a pink one, thought Bill, um, it would probably be a baby as they hadn't grown a lot of fur. No, Linda told them, I know exactly what colour it is because it's the very last one and it's brownie yellow. Perhaps Martin hadn't been feeding it properly. Perhaps the, uh, sorry, perhaps that was the reason its nice pink skin and fur had gone all brown and yellow. Obviously, it needed to be rescued, and fast. He'd better take the bet. I'll do it, he announced. I'll kick the ball through the window and get the one be chew. Talila gave him a bit of a look. You'd better be careful in your dress, she warned. That football is filthy. I'll manage, said Bill Simpson. I know what I'm doing. The news, he noticed, spread like wildfire all along the line of girls perched on the nursery wall and into the little huddles in the corner of the playground. All the girls turned to watch someone have a go at kicking a football straight through the cloakroom window. What's the bet? They asked one another. A wumpy chew. Right then, thought Bill. No reason to hang about. It was a simple enough shot. All he needed was a football. He walked towards the footballers in order to borrow theirs for a moment. Just as he did so, the game happened to swing his way and several boys charged past, knocking Bill flat on his back on the tarmac. Get out of the way, they yelled. We're playing here. Bill picked himself up. He was astonished. Usually, if anyone walked into a football game, the players thought they'd decided to join in. Come in on our side, they'd yell. Be our goalie, take over. But this time, it was as if they weren't so much playing football around him as through him. Get off the pitch! Stop getting in our way! Go around! It was the frock again. He knew it. I want the ball, yelled Bill to the other players. I just want to borrow it for a minute, for a bet. Games always stopped for bets. It wasn't a rule, but they all acted as if they hadn't heard him. Out of our way! You're spoiling the game! The ball happened to bounce Ball's way again, so he leapt up and caught it in his hands. I need it, he explained, just for a moment. The footballers gathered around in a circle. They didn't look at all pleased at his interruption of the game. In fact, they looked rather menacing, all standing there with narrowed eyes, scolding. It was, sorry, if it was the way, sorry, if this was the sort of reception the girls had come to expect, no wonder they didn't stray far from the railings. No wonder they didn't ask to play. Give the ball back. Rohan was really glowering now. Yes, Martin agreed. Why can't you stay in your own bit of the playground? Mystified, Bill asked Martin. Well, what bit? The girls' bit, of course. Bill looked around. Girls were still perched along the nursery wall. Girls were still huddled in the porch. Girls still stood in the tight little groups of each corner. No girl was more than a few feet into the playground itself. Even the pair who had been playing or been trying to play hopscotch had been had given up and gone away. Where's that then? asked Bill. Where's the girls bit? Where are the girls supposed to play? I, I don't know, Martin answered irritably. Anywhere, just somewhere we're not already playing football. But you're playing football all over every single inch of the playground, Bill said. Martin glanced up at the clock on the church tower next to the school. There were only two minutes left before the bell rang and his gang was down by one tiny goal. So you can see them there having the conversation argument about where girls should be on the playground. He spread his, uh, sorry, he spread his hands in desperation. Please give the ball back, he pleaded. What's it worth? 
For the life of him, Bill Simpson couldn't understand why. If Martin wanted the ball back so badly, he couldn't just step forward and try and prize it away from his chest. Then he realised that Martin simply didn't dare. The two of them might end up in a bit of a shoving match, and then a real fight. And no one wants to fight a girl in a pretty pink frock with fiddly shell buttons. So he said cunningly, I'll tell you what it's worth. It's worth your very last wimpy chew. To his astonishment, Martin looked delighted. Done, he said at once, and began digging deep in his trouser pocket. He handed a tiny wrapped rectangle over to Bill. There you are, he said. Here it is. Now give me the football and get off our pitch. Bill Simpson looked down. What's this? he asked. It's what you wanted, Martin said. My very last 1P chew. I'm just going to show you that spelling there. It's a 1P chew here, whereas in all of the others, it's called a 1P chew. In silence, Bill Simpson handed over the football. Where he'd been clutching it tightly against his chest, there was now an enormous brown smudge. In silence, Bill Simpson turned and walked away. If all the girls had not been standing around the edges of the playground watching him, he would have cried. Okay, that is the end of chapter two. Um, I hope you enjoyed that story today. I'm glad it's quite different for girls and boys nowadays. Um, obviously, this story was set a little while ago where there were some differences between what girls and boys did, especially at break times. Um, and I know that you will hopefully look forward to Mrs. Cross or Mrs. Plews uh, continuing with that story very soon. Um, I hope you're enjoying the other reading you're getting up to at home um, and the links we said last week. Um, look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now.